John Golia. I'm Greg Fife. And I'm Todd Curtis. And we are the Flight Safety Detectives. Between us, we have over a century of aviation accident investigation and safety experience to draw on as we discuss issues that affect all of us. So we are qualified to share our perspectives on accidents and incidents and what can be learned from them for the future. We're proud to say that we have two sponsors that really relate to the topic of aviation safety. The Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, or PAMA, and Avemco Insurance. Later on in the show, we'll tell you how you can get a 5% discount on your insurance just for listening to the show. We don't just dissect the official reports. In every episode, we identify safety issues and take the mystery out of accident investigations. So maybe pilots in their planes can have safer flights ahead. Well, hello there, uh, John and Greg, and we have a special guest here with us as well to uh, our show, uh, SC Sam Gwynn, who is a noted author of such books as Rebel Yell and Empire of the Summer Moon, who has a new book this year, His Majesty's Airship, which is about the crash of a rigid airship, uh, the R-101, back in 1930. And uh, SC, uh, well, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's great to be talking with you guys. Well, as you know, we, we cover all sorts of aviation-related events. And although we, we focus on contemporary aviation, this is going back to a crash in 1930, which was several years before the famous uh, airship crash of, of the Hindenburg in Lakehurst, New Jersey. This was the R-101, which crashed in France, killing most of those on board. But before we talk about this event, let's talk about you as, a, as an author who has, of course, written the two books we mentioned and several others, has spent uh, quite some time in uh, the magazine world at both Texas Monthly and most notably Time Magazine. And one of your books, The Empire of the Summer Moon, was a Pulitzer Prize nominee. And uh, you currently live in Austin and have uh, been writing for quite some decades. And given your historical um, books of the 19th century, uh, what was it about uh, this particular event and the story around it that attracted you? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So what, right, I've I, um, recently anyway have been writing about, though I wrote about the Comanche Indians and the frontier of Texas and the kind of the end of the frontier. And I wrote two books about the Civil War including a biography of Stonewall Jackson and, and right, 20th century aviation is a, a, a long way from there. Um, I, I explain that mostly by saying that, you know, I was a journalist um, for most of my career and journalists have short attention spans. I mean, I think that kind of defines us. We have, you know, kind of the attention span of a gnat and, and that's good because we let, what we do in journalism is we write a story and on, the, on Monday afternoon, it's on the bottom of somebody's birdcage, and we move on, and that's good. It's sort of, uh, I'm not somebody, let's say, sitting at a university somewhere and, and devoting my life to Chaucer. That, that is not who I am. Um, so I go for stories as much as anything else. I like stories. I like narratives. I like them in, in particular when they are connected to a large uh, picture. So in this case, um, here's where this idea came from. I'm, I'm reading a magnificent history of the British Empire um, called Pax Britannica by James Morris. I'm reading the final volume, Farewell the Trumpets. It's about the decline and fall of the British Empire. And there's a, like a two page section in there about this airship. And what it said was that it, it said this, this airship was part of a colossal scheme to sort of rule the, the, the world of the skies over the British Empire technologically and in all other ways. And, and that the crash of R101 was sort of symbolic of the, the end and decline of the, the British Empire. And I thought, and it just sounded, I said, well, that's a great story. Well, that, what a great story that is, you know, and uh, this airship crash the seven years before the Hindenburg that nobody's ever heard of before, but it's a great story. And again, only two pages in this book. And so I, I did what all, you know, classically trained historians do. I Googled it and 
to find out if anybody had done this and really nothing of any significance since 1980. Um, and that was not done by a professional writer. So um, although it, it was a book in many ways that had a lot of good, great reporting in it. But that's so I had like clear field to write about this great tale that to me is a, a better story. The Hindenburg is, is the one everybody knows about. It's the benchmark. But this is a better tale. It's a bigger tale, I think, to me anyway. Um, but it it is a uh, it is indeed a tale of the end of empires, a tale of colossal human ambition and human folly. And uh, anyway, I, you know, when I run into a story like that, um, it's going to tempt me to jump from, uh, well, I really, from the Civil War, I really only jumped about 35 years forward to the invention of Zeppelins in 1900. But anyway, that's a long-winded answer to your question. And by the invention of... Hey, Sam. Uh, oh, go ahead, Greg. Yeah. I, I'm unfortunately not with you. I'm, uh, I'm traveling. But um, one of the things about uh, this particular story is I know we didn't get a lot of coverage here in the United States about this particular uh, rigid airship uh, for a variety of different reasons. Was it well known in Britain and the UK territory that this was happening and this was being developed? Um, and if so, did they understand, did the folks understand why it was being developed? Very good question. Um, so yes, in, in, in Great Britain in the 1920s, um, this project they called the Imperial Airship Scheme, which was to literally, they, when they came out of World War I, they had the largest empire the world had ever known. 25% of the globe was British. And yet it took a month to get from Sydney to London. It took two weeks to get from Karachi in India, then in India to London. And this scheme they came up with, uh, the airship scheme, was going to reduce those times by more than half. You know, it was going to be a week to uh, Australia instead of a month. It was going to be four days to India instead of 11 days. You're radically compressing time and space. And they were going to do it all with British technology. So it got huge buildup in the UK, huge buildup. It was kind of, it was, it, it was in its own way, a moonshot. It was viewed that way. So much so that when R101 took off on the fateful flight, October 4th, 1930, that it never made it back from, you know, a million people visited Cardington where the ship airship was built. And, um, you know, it, it, the Prince of, including the Prince of Wales. It, and, and the reaction to in Britain when it went down was, I, I don't want to compare this exactly because they're not, but, but let's say the moonshot had, you know, failed and crashed. Um, there would have been a, a, a great national grievance as there was uh, at when R101 went down. And just to put this in context, in 1930, uh, there was no heavy lift aircraft that could regularly carry passengers in one jump across oceans. It simply didn't exist. So what we take for granted today uh, didn't happen. If you had to go long distances, it was primarily by ship, not by anything uh, in the way of an aerial vehicle. That's, that's a really good observation, and, and it, it is the background in a lot of ways to, to this story, is, um, you know, the concept of wing loading uh, and the technology of that would, would make great strides as we went into the 1930s, but it, in the early going, I mean, it was believed that an airplane wing could only carry so much. And not only that, but if you, let's take India, for example, the, the, the year before, um, R101 tried to make it to India on a what would have been a four-day trip. Um, uh, a British uh, a Hercules trimotor or something went to uh, India, you know, 12 days, 26 stops, kind of bone rattling. It was airships were theoretically better for long range travel. Nobody ever saw them as short range things, but, you know, crossing the Atlantic, which they had done, you know, well before Lindenburg and a no number of times. Um, there was a you know plausible idea that these things could be because you could, you know, you could uh, when when uh, when Ferdinand von Zeppelin I think first flew for twelve hours uh, in, in a Zeppelin and then was attempting a twenty-four hour trip. Uh, the Wright brothers had flown for thirty-eight minutes at that point. Uh, von Zeppelin had twelve people on board with him. The Wrights had you know Orville. <laughs> so there were this moment in time when. You know, technologies of aircraft were, were rapidly improving airplanes much faster than uh, than airships. 
in a lot of ways, you know, when you look at Lindbergh's crossing, uh, you know, Herbert Scott, the great British uh, pilot who was on R101, did a double crossing of the Atlantic in 1919, eight years before Lindbergh did. And when Lindbergh did it, yes, it proved it could be done, and it was the most famous act of heroism the world had ever known, except it also illustrated, like, I'm sorry, do you want to do that? <laughs> do you want to try it? Okay, now that Lindy has done it, y'all want to, y'all want to take the airship and go do that? It was still highly dangerous to fly airplanes long distances. Now, what happened, what in, as history will show, airships were fundamentally flawed technology that could not be fixed. Airships, they both crashed like crazy in the early 1900s. Um, airplanes were fundamentally sound technology that just needed to be tweaked as, it, as they went along. We didn't know that in the 20s yet. Now, as far as the history of the development of uh, rigid airships, there had been, of course, uh, balloons of various types before then. But uh, the airship technology, as I understand it, really uh, was born in Germany. And uh, they were the, far and away the leading uh, lights in that. How did Britain get into the technology of the airship world? It's interesting that so much of uh, airships were, were, and the history of airships, which was only a 40 year, rigid airships, uh, were only a 40 year history. So much of it is bound up with nationalism. In fact, I say in the book that it's one part nationalism, one, one part engineering. Um, Count von Zeppelin invented the first rigid airship, the 450 foot long steel frame thing that you know went up and then went immediately down in, in, in 1900. And then eventually developed um, Zeppelins into weapons which were used extensively in World War II to bomb Europe um, by Germany. The, the British saw great advantages to Zeppelins, both as scout ships and as conceivably as also long range bombers, but could not just could not catch the Germans, could not keep up with them. They, the best they could do was steal German technology from downed Zeppelins, which, which they could do, except that it would mean that by the time they built the thing that they had stolen, it was they were two and a half years behind the Germans who were already flying 700 foot or 680 foot long ships that could fly at 24,000 feet. I mean, it was very, you know, they were always behind and they were trying to catch up. So in a lot of ways, the scheme they came up with in the 20s, of which it was kind of the, what my book's about, it was a, on a very fundamental level, an attempt to emulate and, and surpass the Germans, which they'd never been able to do. The Americans also played catch up. Um, they also had um, terrible experiences with crashes in the 20s, actually flying helium airships, which were allegedly safe. Um, anyway, but yes, the Germans led, everybody else followed, and my book's in a, a, a record of Britain's attempt to kind of shoot the moon and beat the Germans at their own game. Well, I'd like to switch for a moment. And, and to... Sam. Yeah, John. Go, go ahead. Hey, Sam. Um, you know, one of the things about these rigid airships um, is their construction. And of course, the, uh, the first Zeppelins and, and then uh, the Brits airships, uh, the steel structure, I mean, that's, that's very heavy. And I know that uh, the good Lord, um, uh, Tom, Thompson, Thomason. Yeah, Lord Thompson, um, yes, the, the main man. He, yeah, he, when, when they built their airship, he wanted to put all this extravagance in the, the cabin, if you will, of this airship, um, which of course, you know, he wanted ornate carpets and, and all sorts of stuff, which, added to significantly added to the weight um, that uh, of that airship and of course reduced the real payload so yeah you have all this extravagance but you can only carry three people um, <laughs> what was the what was the evolution of that um, as far as making things lighter because the one thing that really interested me was the gas bags themselves that held the hydrogen they were so thin, you could actually punch a hole in it with your finger. So you know that during construction of, of, the, of the airship, the, the folks that were working on it had to be extremely careful. And if I read correctly in the book, um, there had been a couple of people that actually fell through those, those gas That's bags. Funny. Well, let me start with the gas bags. There, it's a fascinating part of the, of the rigid airship story. Um, the idea of using gas bags, big ones, was invented by Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin in the early 1900. Um, and that became 
kind of the, the way an airship, a rigid airship work. You had the steel structure. It had to lift a lot, as you say, because I mean, what, whatever you were gonna do with it, carry bombs or passengers or whatever, you know, you were gonna have to, uh, 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 you know, have a lot of lift. Um, and so these gas bags got bigger and bigger. And as World War I went by, the German airships got bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, up to 700 feet long, which as you can imagine, we're talking more than two football fields. I mean, these things were absolutely, um, uh, were absolutely huge. But the, the, uh, to get back to the gas bags, so the gas bags, if you looked at, uh, let's take R101, which had 5.5 million cubic feet of hydrogen gas inside of it held in gas bags. And if we looked at the central gas bag, it would look to you like a giant cheese wheel. And when I, when I mean giant, I mean 10 stories high is this gas bag. And it, it holds half a million, 550,000 cubic feet of, of hydrogen, but it is built out of cow intestines, which is what, you know, the, the Germans kind of figured out. And why, why would you ever, you, and when I say cow intestines, I mean, think of sausage casings. It's what it is, sausage casings. It's the cecum, of, it's the, the top of, but it, it, it would, we all know what it is. It's a sausage casing. Why would you ever use that in a 10 story gas bag to hold hydrogen? I mean, well, you know how, we well, you know how thin that is. I'm sorry, it is, it is, it is built out of the, the intestine, except it's backed with a very thin layer of cotton, but you can, you can easily, it doesn't take much to poke through it. The reason was hydrogen is the, is the lightest element and it also tends to get out from wherever you put it. It just tends to leak. And the most impermeable subject uh, substance that anybody could find, and they tried all sorts of things. And Goodyear eventually developed some kind of polymer that could do it. Um, uh, but years and years and years later, but you know, th this was, this was it. And so you, you know, 500,000 cows died for R101. They, the Argentine slaughterhouses would ship these cattle and test these gooey things with mucus and blood all over them. And they would come to these warehouses in Cardington where the airships were built and, and, and these women would scrape the blood and the mucus off and the place reeked of awful. And then they would, Put the cotton backing on. I mean, and you would. I, I've got a picture of of uh, several of the gas bags in my book, and you can see how how absolutely thin they were. And so you have this paradox. It's a steel structure, which is relatively strong, but on the other hand, it 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 is covered with thin ply linen that's doped, meaning put some gunk on it so that it it uh you know it uh, like like an airplane wing, so that it becomes impermeable to rain. But it's a thin piece of linen or cotton protecting a cattle intestine, cow intestine that is holding the gas bags. And it, this has everything to do with why R101 crashed. But th these things were terrifically fragile, hugely vulnerable to wind. And, and, uh, and of course, one spark in the hydrogen anywhere, and you get, well, you get what we all saw, what we've all seen on TV. Now, let me stop here for a and second and ask uh, Greg and John a question. Uh, obviously, the two of you have had extensive experience investigating accidents of all kinds. How often do you come across aircraft with uh, either doping technology or other sorts of uh, interesting engineering aspects to it that's not quite as interesting as this, in my opinion, but how often do you come across something like this in investigations and stuff that you've done? We've had to look at this from a different angle because it's being done in a way radically different from most other aviation accidents you deal with? Well, to start with, and then I'll let John chime in, where we see this more often than not is with experimental home-built type aircraft, where you have people that um, have come up with some engineering prowess to invent or develop a flying machine of some caliber, and we see that often at Oshkosh Air Venture, which John and I just returned from, where you look at some of these machines and you just shake your head like, how does that fly? How could that fly? And, you know, what was the guy drinking when he dreamed this one up? Um, but you see a variety of not only different designs, but construction materials used 
in in the in the forming of the structure itself or the covering of the wing like Sam was talking about and um, and then of course when you go out to investigate it if uh, if it's involved in an incident or accident you now have to learn and it may not be, even be a common source you may have to learn from the owner if they've survived the event or you have to start studying material and where we're seeing a lot of this now is composite material um, as we've seen with uh, with the Titan uh, mishap and things like that. So, I mean, I see it, you know, when I have to go out and do experimental um, type aircraft that are involved in an accident. John, I know you've seen it, you know, just in uh, in the maintenance side of well, the house. You know, look at the DC-3. It was built in 1939 and they were still building them, I think, in the 50s. And that airplane has fabric covered uh, control surfaces all over it. The DC-6 had fabric covered control surfaces. So, which by the way is a composite material. So people think that because uh, we talk about carbon fiber composites being used on the 787 and a lot of other airplanes uh, and the submarine, that that's just, that is the composite material. But we've been using composites from the beginning of time. Linen dope and fabric is nothing but linen and in, uh, in a catalyst being the dope. So we've we've had this for a long time. I don't know of any airplane that was built using uh, animal intestines, though. <laughs> so that that's a little bit different. Sam, you know, it in looking at uh, it, it, this airship, um, of course, you know, it, it took what, six seven years for development and things like that. Um, and then, of course, you know, uh, the Germans were, were well ahead of the game. But, you know, when, when you look at this kind of uh, construction method, they were using a different type of engine than that of the Zeppelin. It, it, uh, it was using heavy fuel, which uh, is more of a, a very thick or heavy kerosene diesel fuel. What was the motivation there? Was it just because the engine had been developed in the UK and it was, you know, their own, if you will? I mean, why didn't they use something more conventional? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. It goes back to, to what you were saying earlier about weight. Um, and w one of the problems with R101 is how much weight they put into it. And the principal place they put that weight in is they decide, here's what they decided. They said, okay, we're, we're flying to the tropics, you know, we're going from London to Karachi, which was in India then. And, uh, you know, we're, when we hit the tropics, you know, the, the fumes from the gasoline engines would be, would be possibly ignitable and we can't afford to have any, now this was only theoretical, no one knew this, as it turns out that wasn't really a problem and it never became a problem in heavier than air, as, as the airship people like to call airplanes. Um, but uh, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, going to uh, India, which was a you know uh, a, a, a four day trip, uh, going over the deserts of Iraq and everything, and they thought this was going to be a, be a problem. Anyway, so what they did is they they decided that instead of taking a gasoline engine up into the aircraft to drive its propellers, uh, the airship. They, just, they were going to use these diesels. They happened to be manufactured by Beardmore, which was an English company, as you said. The Beardmore Tornado diesels, I think they were 650 horsepower. They were hugely heavy, and they had been locomotive engines. And these guys lugged them up into these engine nacelles that were slung below the airship. This had never been done before. And the reason the Germans hadn't done it was because it was just too damn heavy. And um, the British did it only because this was part of the idea, we're going to make R101 safe as a house. We're going to make it absolutely so safe that just virtually nothing can happen to it. And that's going to include the fact that we're using heavy oil, diesels that have, a, you know, that really, really, uh, what do we call it? A low flash point or a high flash point, whichever. They, they're hard to ignite. Um, and, uh, and so they lug these things up and they put them up into these into the five engine nacelles that with the propellers on them, you know, slung below the airship that drove the airship and just added absolutely enormous amounts of weight 
to the ship, which they then had to I don't know, try to figure out how to compensate for it. They ended up, because they, they screwed this up so badly, they ended up having to cut R101 in half shortly before she left, insert new a new uh, bay in the middle with, with, a, with a, a, a huge gas bag in it to, um, to accommodate this heaviness that was accounted for by all the stuff they had put in. Now, uh, I'm not going to go into the whole issue of what kind of supplemental type certificate one would need to cut an aircraft in half today. Uh, this was something that was a national project in Britain and something where they clearly had the support of the government in doing this. So how much leeway did they have to be creative in ways such as you just described? They, um, they Actually, the, the project itself, it was called the Imperial Airship Scheme, had two flagships. So R101 was one of them. It had a sister ship that was smaller. Um, and the, the R101 was known as the socialist airship. It was a product of the Britain's first labor government, which was, they were socialists. They believed the, the government should own the major means of production. Um, and you had R100, which was its sister ship, which was called the capitalist airship because it was, it was being given a, it was going to be built by Vickers and it was going to be built on a fixed cost contract. They were going to we're give you this much money, go build it. We don't expect you to use any technology, much new technology, because we're not giving you enough money to do that. So just kind of build the, quote, capitalist airship on a conventional Zeppelin design, basically. And then came R101. This was the socialist airship, I mean, very good socialist, big government terms. They said, well, cost plus all the way, baby, <laughs> as much as you want to spend. But you know, it, I guess it's a, an illustration. The, the bad, the illustration of what's wrong with socialism. Uh, the you know, it's like put in whatever you need. Do if you're going to do these crazy kind of uh, parachute harnesses that hold the airbags that no one's ever done before, or, or hoist the, these heavy, heavy diesels up, or build the asbestos lined smoking rooms, or the or the or the, the, the lounges, the cocktail lounges in the dining room, and all of the stuff that goes in here. Um, you know, go ahead, go do it. And there was no limit to what, um, and, and it, it affected, there's a, there's a, there's a graphic of R101 that somebody put out once that has a little, little box is showing every piece of technology that they put into it. And from material science down to pumps, down to you name it, they put it in there and it was just loaded to the gills and it lasted seven hours in the year. <laughs> well, so well, getting, getting back to, your book, to um, his majesty's airship, uh, this is not just a story about engineering. This is not a story about action investigation. This covers a whole range of topics, including, I guess, uh, taking us back to that time in history in Great Britain. Uh, for the reader who might be aviation-oriented or not aviation-oriented, what are the things that would be attractive about this book, just to have it in your own hot little hands and read it? I think that it's a it's a story of colossal ambition. It's focused on one man, Lord Christopher Birdwood Thompson, uh, who has that ambition and who drives this along. He's the man who was on board. He died. He's an interesting, colorful guy. He's got this fairy tale princess Romanian girlfriend who happens to be the toast of literary Paris and Marcel Proust's friend. And I mean, it, go, it kind of goes on. It, there's there are some great characters here that are driving it. I think. Whenever I write a narrative like this, I, I hang it off people. I, I don't. It's not just a dry accounting of, of a process, if you will. It's it's the story of Christopher Thompson's, Thompson's doomed colossal ambition. It's the story of, uh, um, uh, you know, George Herbert Scott, the, the, the who was on board also and died, and who kind of had technically had the say of the no go or no go for the, the fated trip where they they died, but. If you look at Thompson, Thompson was a, was a terrible dipsomaniac drunk by this point, and he shouldn't have been on board the thing, which was a tragedy in itself. But in 1919, he took a British airship, R-34, that was a complete Zeppelin knockoff in, in kind of the worst way. It was, it was the, the last of the Zeppelins were called height climbers, and they were built to get away from British, British fighter planes shooting incendiary bullets. But way could go well, well above 20,000 feet. They were huge. They had all this lift on them. They were stripped down. And the British found one of these that had crashed and copied it and built R-34 which had no business doing anything except being a German height climber bombing London, except that Scott took it across the Atlantic 
And in the first, first east to west crossing, which is the hard way, right? Lindbergh goes the easy way. East to west is the hard way. Scott takes this thing, first east-west crossing, first double crossing of the Atlantic in 1919, eight years before Lindbergh. And uh, in the most harrowing, I mean, he had no business surviving this thing. This thing went almost went down a dozen times. And it was it's just, he was a global hero. He deserved to be a global hero. If people knew how dangerous it had actually been, he would have been more than that. So he, George Herbert Scott is one of my heroes, Lord Thompson. He's so so I, I, I hang this thing off of, uh, you know, a, horror, a, ter- a chapter in a terrible crash of a British airship in 1921. I hang it on the designer. It's his story and where he went terribly wrong. And, and so I think that as much as anything, you can read it for a story of empire, story of early aviation, but you can also read it as a, it's a great human tale, I think. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about a fun new podcast called So There I Was. If you're a fan of aviation or simply enjoy hearing captivating stories, then this is the podcast for you. Hosted by former Marine pilots Fig and Repeat, this podcast shares firsthand accounts of flying experiences that will have you on the edge of your seat. Whether you're in the mood for something funny, scary, poignant, or tragic, this podcast has it all. With a relaxed and conversational tone, the pilots share their stories like you're sitting right there with them at the bar after a flight. Hear from fighter pilots, astronauts, Blue Angels, aircraft carrier captains, Navy and Coast Guard rescue pilots, and many more. Most have survived near-death experiences. Others have overcome incredible disabilities to continue to fly airplanes. You'll hear about heart-pumping moments in the cockpit, hilarious screw-ups during flights, insane hijinks off-duty, and the challenges pilots routinely face. Hear what it feels like to be shot off the bow of a carrier or into space. Experience the terror of landing on a pitching deck on a night so black that the pilot can barely taxi afterwards because his legs are shaking so badly. Hear firsthand how lonely it is to be in the middle of the ocean in a life raft on a dark night in eight-foot seas. Each story is unique and told with a level of detail that will make you feel like you were there. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll laugh until you cry. But one thing is certain, you won't be bored. So there I was. It's how all great aviation tales begin. Hey, Sam, um, you know, as we are talking, and this is a, a safety-related show because of uh, John and, uh, and Todd and myself, I can't let you go without talking about what was the safety aspects built into these airships, given the fact that they are flying hydrogen gas bags and basically a, a hydrogen bomb. How or what technology was incorporated that if you did have a leak in one of the gas bags, what were they using or what were they doing to mitigate the explosion um, possibility? And if there was some sort of fire that broke out, was it, you know, you signed the waiver saying, I accept all risk, you know, if something happens, too bad. Yeah, so first of all, if the fire does break out, you've got 20 seconds before you're a, you're a piece of carbon. It, 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 well, think of the Hindenburg. That's how fast it goes. That's what happened to R101. Um, Inspection-wise, and, and one of the ways they, they, they tried to, to answer your question about a leak in a bag, um, they had these little air holes at the kind of the front of the, at the bow of the ship. And uh, as the ship went, which, which allowed air to pass through and out these kind of gills in the back which was their way of, of, of venting. But their problem with safety was they put emphasis in the wrong places, like the diesels. That really, I mean, they got they convinced themselves that this was a giant risk, but it really wasn't. Um, they put a lot of effort in there. That was gonna be safety because boy, these diesels couldn't possibly catch on fire. They made the, you, you guys will get a kick out of this as, uh, with your background. They made the, the steel and duralium and frame Four times, you know, there's a four, four factor on that. Four times as strong as it needed to be. Okay, this is this was because in 1921 the R38 had sort of bent, collapsed in half. Uh, now that had happened for other reasons, and th- there was no need to build this thing four times stronger than it needed to be. I mean, that was way overkill. Meanwhile, they neglect the outer cover. They neglect mainly to test it. The outer cover, remember, is made of cotton and linen, d- doped, and is, is I, I can put my finger through it. And uh, they 
you needed to test that in weather. You needed to fly the airship into a 45 mile an hour wind for, for many hours to see what rain and wind would do to a flimsy cover like that, protecting ever flimsier big gas bags. They didn't test it. The, you know, the gas bags were untestable. They were what they were. I mean, the, you, could, you could vent gas through the hull, but um, this idea, uh, and, and, and the, the ship had great problems with the gas bags, which were held in these parachute harnesses, chafing against the girders, which created holes in them. So there was leakage all over the place multiple times. They never fixed it. And right before the ship went, I mean, the inspectors, whom they, they did not pay any attention to, said, you can't fly this thing, both because of all the holes in the gas bags created by the girders, and also because the, um, you know, the cover has been untested and the cover kept failing and 140 long foot long strips were, would peel off of it. They, they, they managed to, to um, squash and overrule their own inspectors, which is one of the, you know, I, I tell this, this story in, in detail in, in the book of how as, as we get closer and closer to the flight, they ignore and ignore and ignore what's being told to them. And eventually they conclude that all they have to do, they've cut the ship in half, they've expanded it, they've done all these things, they've put new cover on and they've done various things. And they decide at some point, all they need is a 24 hour trial in fair weather. Now, if you could imagine, a, 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 well, of an era that was about to come in England, like putting a spitfire through only 24 hours in fair weather, uh, that wouldn't tell you much about what a Spitfire could do. Wow, that's you know that, you, and you bring up an interesting point about you know their inspectors trying to do the right thing, only to be backed down or squashed. You know what? We still have that problem today that we haven't fixed, um, and we've seen it in the recent past with a variety of different aircraft and some of the things that have come out from an accident investigation. Um, I, I did a show about the Hindenburg, and when I went to Lakehurst, one of the things that was uh, very interesting was the uh, was Hangar One, where the where the Zeppelin would reside when it was there, uh, being prepped for the trip back to Germany. There was a, over a million bricks in the hangar, and they were all rubber coated. The tools were special tools that were basically rubber coated to prevent sparking and things like that. Were you required or were the crew required to wear special outfits and, and, and that kind of thing when they were working on they, these uh, They on did, these they airships? were. They had special uh, shoes and th they had things that were, were not supposed to right, generate any, any kind of spark up there. Yes, there, there, was, there were protocols and rules everywhere in, in the ship. Uh, obviously, no Including magic. static electricity. Because static electricity was, you know, could also fire all of that stuff off as well. And, and we, we take that for granted, but uh, a lot of it is, you know, in the wintertime when, you, when you're rubbing a wool blanket, that little spark of static electricity could have taken that airship out of the sky. And, and in fact, when the, 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 the first really, one of the first really big spectacular Zeppelin crashes, 1908, was static electricity. Um, uh, caused by, I think they were trying out a new type of, uh, of gas bag material that, you know, uh, they thought, they think generated just that very kind of static electricity and blew up a, a 550 foot long airship and was the reason they went back to gas bags, and, sorry, to cattle intestines and, and stayed with them. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, there were so many protocols and and a lot of it, you know, the, both Germans and Americans were in, in denial, uh, sorry, and, and, and the Brits were in, in denial about hydrogen. They just came up with ideas that, you know, it's really only dangerous when it mixes with air, you know, and well, that's not true. <laughs> that isn't true. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they had these ideas, you know, about, about things and, and they convinced themselves. And when they interviewed the people who were you know, who are flying around in these hydrogen and asking them how dangerous it was. And all the crew said, oh, we don't really think it's that dangerous. They just, they just, it was, it was an odd underestimation of risk. Now, uh, in our show, we typically end it with uh, myself giving the next to last word and John having the last word. And I'd like to switch things up a little bit. Have our guest, SC uh, Sam Gwynn, give the next to last word and telling us about your book. And, and of course, uh, uh, John, you'll have the last word. So, uh, Sam, uh, take it away. 
Well, I think it's, you know, I think the book is, is, is of interest to people. Um, as you said before, if they're interested in aviation, it's certainly a book about aviation and it, and, and it includes both heavier than air and lighter than air aviation. As and I said, it's also a, it's a human story and it's, it's, it's a story really of colossal ambition. But at some point I realized when I was writing this book, you know, at some point, you, sometimes you realize what you're really writing about. Yes, I'm writing about the Imperial Airship Scheme and Lord Thompson and all this stuff and the Germans. But what I'm really writing about is human folly on an absolutely colossal scale. And John? Well, you know, it's interesting that we're talking for the last hour or so about hydrogen and, uh, you know, 100 years ago, and it looks like we're coming full circle again. We're looking at hydrogen all over again. And the, the problems with hydrogen haven't gone away. So it's going to be interesting to see how modern technology handles the hydrogen and the issues. So, and it, it may be folly again. Who knows? But for our audience, we're flying regular airplanes on a daily basis. So please, if you're going to go flying, do a good free planning session. Do it even before you get to the airport and then do it again at the airport. Make sure you check in the weather, where you are, where you're going and in between. And don't forget to do a very thorough walk around of your airplane. I still see people that don't do very much looking at the airplane before they go anywhere. We were just out at Oshkosh and we were talking that up. And there is some people that just don't even know what a good walk around encompasses. So please do a good walk around. And when you get in the air with that head on a swivel, you know, we had two helicopters collide out in Oshkosh. You would think with all the airplanes and all the flying going on, that those guys would be on top of their game, watching anything and everything. And yet they managed to slam into one another. So please, please fly safely. And once again, thanks to our guest, uh, S.C. Gwynn whose new book, His Majesty's Airship, is available now. Thank you for checking out our show. We really value our listeners and subscribers. Our podcast gets ranked by you and how much you like it. So please give us five stars in your podcast platform. We want to keep in contact with you. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. You can email the show at flightsafetydetectives at gmail.com. By the way, if you're on YouTube, we're really working on growing the channel, and it helps if you all send in comments. Please do that, and we read all the comments. And be sure to subscribe. Remember, if you're in the market for aviation insurance, you can save 5% with Avemco just by mentioning our show. Visit them at www.avemco.com. That's it for this episode of the Flight Safety Detective. Until the next episode, fly safe.